All right, I think we're recording here. Uh, this message is for myself uh, and friends or family, maybe, but hopefully just for myself. Uh, my name is Stephen Keating, and going into brain surgery tomorrow. And in case I change at all, I wanted to provide my future self with my present self's thoughts. So I've always been interested in data and learning about things. I used to take apart GPS devices and strap them to my ankle and capture my daily routes and look at that data and try to figure out what it meant. And throughout university, I would always try to participate in lots of studies, one to help science, but also because I was curious about it all. I saw a opportunity to do a research scan. So I volunteered and I wanted to see what the data would be like and I asked to see it. And they showed me and they said, by the way, we actually found a small abnormality here. Uh, they didn't know what the abnormality was, um, but there wasn't a huge amount of concern because I wasn't symptomatic in any way. So I went about my life, uh, came down to MIT, and then uh, last year in the summer in 2014, I started to smell a very faint vinegar smell for just a few seconds a day. And I went actually back to that original data set uh, of the scan and saw what the abnormality was and realized that's near the smell center of my brain. I pushed to have another scan done because of the previous findings. And I really didn't think that the scan was gonna show anything because the doctors weren't concerned. They booked it for a month later. And uh, usually the, the people running the scan will let you leave and let the doctor explain the results. But when I had the scan, the person running the scan said, you're not leaving. You need to stay in the hospital. You have a massive tumor. I mean, I don't necessarily know, know that I'm not a typical patient. I think everyone's trying to do what they can to stay alive. The part that I was very interested in was trying to collect as much data as I could to make the best decision possible. There's nothing better than a really engaged patient. Medicine's not easy. It's still an art and a science. Um, making the right choices is complicated, not only for the patient, but also for the clinician. And a frank and open discourse about that makes all the difference in the world. Patients don't always have access to the medical information that they need to really join the conversation. And that's what I've been sharing, which is this question, how come as a patient, we're last in line to our own data? How come my doctors and my university researchers can see my tumor genome and I can't? Why are there so many barriers for, for getting access to my own data? No one really sees the problems involved with getting access to your own data until you're in the hot seat. In July 2008, just a week after my 29th birthday, I was diagnosed with a slow-growing but malignant brain cancer and immediately admitted me to the hospital and scheduled me to have brain surgery the following week. And then the tumor grew back within six months. And so I was all, screw it all. I guess I don't have a job anymore and I'm gonna have another brain surgery and now dealing with cancer is my life. And this is my job. And maybe because I saw it as this is my job, Everything that I had in my toolbox of skill sets related to my job, I applied towards it. And my toolbox of skill sets was, I'm gonna communicate, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna design cool graphics, I'm gonna make little memes, I'm gonna make a video, I'm gonna do those things. So I write a blog called The Liz Army, and it's just basically about a person who's living with brain cancer. As a layperson who's gone through this cancer experience, I definitely can tell you for a fact that other patients are interested in connecting with somebody like me, that they can share their story, who can understand what they're going through. And I don't expect people to go to read my blog to get advice on how they should cure their disease, but it is 
a legitimate, a very legitimate source of what an actual patient experience is. I was just out there being as honest as possible to let other people know what this experience is like. And I think that's one of the things people appreciate most. Um, you know, the first thing I think of when I, when I think of seeing the effect she's had on other people, um, we went to a young adult, well, it's basically like cancer con, and there was this girl, Emily, and she just came up and like gave Liz the biggest hug and was just so excited to meet Liz, like came up to me, gave me a hug. I was like, oh my God, I've read all about you. And, uh, you know, just to see that she could have that kind of impact on people, I think that was pretty amazing. Thank you so much for this beautiful blog. My husband was diagnosed with a glioblastoma grade four 27 months ago and is doing great. Well, pretty much great aside from the whole brain cancer thing. Ha <laughs> ha. Your voice and that of those like you has been missing from this conversation. Thanks for all you do for us. If you were to get diagnosed with something uh, today and you would want to access the system the same way I do, we don't all have the same tools. It's not the same outside of my health system. It's not the same throughout the state. It's not the same throughout the country. There is no one open electronic medical record system that everyone knows. So for me in cancer, there's not a roadmap at all. Right now I can do many different types of clinical trials, chemotherapies, different types of radiation. So how do they vary in terms of liability and risk? What is the patient experience like, right? Maybe I don't care that it's this one treatment has a 1% higher chance of survival if it involves terrible misery and pain for the next six months of my life, right? So how come we can't uh, have that data in a, an easy to digest format that we can share and use to make proper decisions? I'm like, well, I have this data, and this is to help the good of mankind, and it, if I could just, like, quantify myself my way to a cure, I, don't, I didn't see that being the right phrase. So I remembered the phrase open source, and I was like, I, I just want to open source my quantified self and share whatever I have to offer to hopefully get to something greater that could help people diagnose one day. It actually helped me make medical uh, decisions. So being at MIT, I actually had the incredible fortune of having an amazing advisor uh, who helped me find uh, a surgeon. Basically, we put my data online and sent it around and said, which surgical studio and surgeon has the most experience with this specific condition? So putting that data online, being able to share it, was able to actually figure out which surgeon to use. Yeah, so. This is the surgery footage. It's 10 hours. This is a one minute version of it. It's sped up. <laughs> yeah, this is 10 hours in one minute. And this is them actually cutting out my brain and uh, cutting out my skull. And here's them opening up my brain tissue there. And you can hear me talking here. We're doing good. We have your brain exposed. We're actually measuring it. I don't know if you could hear that, but I just said this is a pretty cool experience. <laughs> I guess I started thinking about patients having access to data sort of as a byproduct of having a lot of conversations with patients and with clinicians over the years. And I've heard doctors in particular talk about um, the idea of actually sharing notes with patients. You know, when I suggested it to my colleagues, um, half of them thought I'd lost it and half of them thought it was kind of a neat idea. Open Notes sort of sprang out of that parallel story from cl both clinicians and patients. It's basically the notion we should share equally. We should be totally transparent with what we're thinking. It's the patient's body, it's the patient's mind, and it's up to us to understand that, for them to understand the way we're thinking, for us to get together to share decisions, to share plans. And that's what Open Notes is the beginning of. We wanted to offer ready access to patients for those things that we write about them. The law gives them that access, but we've made it as difficult as humanly possible for them to get that. And 
So has it been helpful for you to see your notes? Oh, it's fantastic. It's everything's right there that you said to me. Okay. I said, awesome. Because <laughs> sometimes I miss, you know, with the cochlear implant that makes it difficult sometimes to hear. Time with me, unfortunately, is very short. And patients will have questions or want clarification on items that we may not have time to get through in a visit. And so it's, it's of vital importance in that way. Like I said, I don't always catch everything that she's saying to me, and I can call it up again and then remember what it was I wanted to discuss with her the next time I came, and it was right there. Patients told us that they felt much more in control of their care, that they felt much better educated, they felt much better prepared, and particularly thrilling was the fact that they were taking their medicines better. At the end of the study, with a 12-month commitment, the doctors had the op option to stop not one of the participating doctors turned it off. So if you want to play devil's advocate, because a lot of, I get asked these questions a lot of the time, is too much information possible, right? What about privacy concerns? What about health insurance concerns? Um, and these are all valid questions. Privacy in itself is a very complicated topic. If you're healthy, you worry about privacy. If you're sick or if you're in the emergency room, you could give a damn about privacy. You just want everyone to have access to everything right away so you can be helped. So it's a complicated dynamic. I think it's, first of all, important to remember that all patients are not the same and that we should allow a variance depending on a patient's choice. If you don't want to share anything, of course you don't need to share anything. If you want to share everything, you should be able to. As long as the patient is able to understand the liabilities they are taking, they should be able to make those decisions. And we think full transparency is the platform for better care, for engaging patients much more actively in their care. And there's no reason why it can't be a two-way street like that. Instead of a paternalistic view where it's all top-down, we should have bottom-up communication from the patient side, right? You should be able to not just receive data from the hospital, you should be able to provide it. You know far better than I what happened to you in the last month. Why shouldn't you write it down? Why shouldn't that become part of the record? That holds, I think, frankly, greater promise for patient engagement than just plain reading it. That's all on the horizon. How to get the healthcare system to acknowledge that benefit and somehow help elevate and, and empower patients to be open about it, being willing to share their data for research purposes in some capacity. If they recognize that could be a benefit, then that just opens the door for us to work together and somehow benefit patients and people being diagnosed with things in the future. Why can't we have a, you know, an app where you can say, yeah, 3D print my skull or donate this blood to research and they're gonna make me an author on this paper. Instead of me having to create my own website and put all that data there, there needs to be a more standard way. Why can't we have a share button? By opening the conversation about my story, there are many people who have told me how much it has been of value to them, whether they are an individual and they're going through this experience and they're saying, hey, that that's exactly how I feel, or thanks for giving me a heads up that this is down the line. Or you're a caregiver going, thanks for letting me know that you know this is probably what my husband's saying and he, he's not sharing with me. One of the most powerful comments I've ever received is from a parent and their child can't verbalize or tell them what it is is going on in their mind. They feel like by reading my words that like this may be what their child would say if they could speak. There's not many benefits to having a brain tumor. Um, one is that I have a good excuse if I forget something. I just say they must have cut that part out. Uh, I've done that many times. <laughs> um, and another one is that you get a very interesting perspective on life. And so I, I sent out a final email to all my uh, friends and family uh, right before the surgery. I wanted to read uh, a couple of that la those last few sentences from that email. Perspective is everything, and switching shoes yields the most powerful thoughts. Family and friends are what remain when the world blurs. Gather data as often as possible and share with the world. It could save your life one day. I never would have gone to the neurological folks if I didn't have the open data from the research scan. 
Uh, and then the very last sentence of that email uh, was, the world is a lovely, splendid, and fascinating place, but most of all to me, it's beautifully curious. I'm ready to climb this mountain inside impossible heights. Said you'd always be my white blood. Circulate the right love, giving me your white blood. Right here with me Said you'd always be my